We are live here at the Global Azure Virtual Conference. Uh, I'm Jonathan Wood, and I'll be going over using C Sharp for data science and machine learning. So, and what I'll be doing, I'll be using the data analytics package for the data science part and ML.NET for the machine learning part. And so, Quick agenda here. Uh, first, I want to go over the .NET Interactive. And that is just, I'm going to run all the code in a Jupyter Notebook. And that's how, we, that's what we need to install to allow us to run the C-sharp code inside the Jupyter Notebook. So it just installs the C-sharp kernels for us. And then I'm going to pretty much just make this as, uh, I guess, a, a project kind of a talk. A, it's going to be pretty small amount of slides, uh, so we can just go straight into the code and go over have have enough time to go over that. But real quick, before we install .NET Interactive, a couple of prerequisites that we're going to need. First, uh, I would suggest installing Anaconda. Uh, that installs the Python packages that you need. Most importantly, it installs Jupyter. Uh, that we will need later. And you will need the .NET CLI installed as well. And I think that comes when you install the .NET Core SDKs. So to install the .NET Interactive, you will need to run this command here in the, in the terminal, .NET tool install, and the dash G will tell it to make a global install. And the add source flag will tell it what source to use to download the tool from, and you'll give the name of the tool Microsoft.NET-Interactive. And then once that's installed, you would actually run the Jupyter kernels inside the .NET Interactive by running the .NET Interactive Jupyter install command. And then just to kind of verify, you can run the Jupyter kernel spec list. And in fact, that's Jupyter kernel spec list, so we'll see what it happens. Uh, by default, with Anaconda, you get the Python kernel. But once the .NET Interactive is installed, you'll see these three, the C Sharp, F Sharp, and PowerShell kernels. So you're not limited to just C Sharp. You can do F Sharp and PowerShell inside of Jupyter Notebook as well. Right. And then to run the, the Jupyter Notebook or uh, I like what I like to do is I like to run Jupyter Lab because it's more like uh, it's kind of a small uh, code editor in my browser. So it comes with a couple of nice features. And so you would just run Jupyter Lab in the terminal, or if you prefer, you can run Jupyter Notebook, and that will launch the Jupyter service and the you know start a uh, notebook for you to start working with. All right, so with that, well, let's go into our Jupyter Lab here. And once you first start it, you'll get a screen like this. Uh, you can create a Python notebook, and then you'll see all the, the these other .NET ones, uh, the C Sharp, F Sharp, and then PowerShell. Uh, these other Python ones are for uh, some Conda environments that I have. And so let's create a new .NET one. And real quick, let's look at our data that we're going to be using. And this is the bank data set. Uh, you get this from the UCI Machine Learning Repository website. And this is just a bunch of data about customers on the bank. And the thing that we want to look at here is this default. Uh, does somebody default on their loan or not? And it's got some, uh, just some different information about the customer, the age, what kind of job they have, marital status, education, and uh, stuff like that. So the first thing is we need to install our packages that we're going to be using. And to do that, you do the uh, hash r, and then we're going to be installing from NuGet. So we need to prepend it with NuGet colon. And we're going to be doing Microsoft.ml. And I'm going to do the 1.4 version. And I'm also going to install 
the Microsoft that data analysis package. And I'll try not to do too much typing here. I'll probably copy and paste uh, a good bit, especially the larger chunks of code here. Just uh, I'm pretty sure y'all didn't come here to see me type. Uh, so I'll try to limit that as much as I can. All right, so those things installed, I'm going to do some uh, imports here. So we use Microsoft.ml. Then we use Microsoft.data analysis. And then I'm going to directly import the Microsoft ML that data package. And then for some plots, I'm using xplot dot plotly. And I believe uh, this xplot package is actually installed from .NET Interactive, so you don't have to do that separately. And I'm going to bring in some link. And the thing you kind of have to do, at, at least at this point, is you have to tell Jupyter how to format the data frame uh, type here. Otherwise, it just won't look correctly. And this just tells it how to, to uh, format uh, that for you. All right, so all that is good to go. Next, let's bring in our data. And we can do that by calling data frame that load CSV and pass in the name of our um, file that we want to do. And we tell the separator is going to be, I think it was a semicolon. And then I'll display it. There we go. So if you're familiar with pandas, this looks pretty much exactly like pandas will uh, appear for you. Um, it's pretty much the same data that we looked at uh, in this uh, view here. So once the data is loaded, now we can start kind of looking at our data, asking questions about it. And the, the data frame type uh, does give a good amount of ways in which we can look at our data and kind of do some analysis on it. So first we can call the info method on it. And that kind of, that mainly just gives us uh, what data type it kind of imputed from the data. So we get some, some strings here for our categorical data and then some singles for our numerical data. And then you can look at the links here and this kind of gives you an idea if there are any null values in your data set. So all these are the same number. So that kind of gives us a hint that there are no null values in there. Next, I'd like to run a description method on our data. And that gives, it gives that length property again, but it also gives like the max values, min values, and the averages of those. So what we can tell from here is that uh, we have customers that with the max age of 87 and the uh, minimum age of 19. Uh, maximum balance and minimum balance and some stuff like that. Next, let's do, let's answer some questions here uh, from our data. Uh, first, let's look at the jobs here. We do data and we can call the group by method on the data frame object. We want to group by the job and then get the count of each of the jobs. There we go. So if you notice, because we did the count, all of these, uh, the numbers here in each of the columns are going to be the same because there are no null values. So this is just the counts of each of the columns. So they're all going to be the same. We can kind of look and we see, see management has high number of jobs and students have a low number. But we can actually do better than this because we have to manually look through the data to answer our questions here. We can help ourselves out by plotting these, uh, this data. And to do that, we can call chart plot. And I'm going to do a new graph. It's going to be a bar graph. 
and I need to set my X axis. So I'll use the jobs and use the columns property. And it's like a dictionary, so I'll call it job item from a name. And for my Y axis, I do jobs, columns, and I, I just do age. Uh, it doesn't matter since they're all the same number. So I just do that first one there. And so now, now we have a pretty nice plot of uh, of our jobs. And so we see, yeah, management was the number one, blue collar is pretty close, but we ha have some stuff that we didn't see up here. We also see there's unknown is actually the, the least number. And then there's student, unemployed and all that. So it just gives a better representation of your data and it's easier to look at too. And as you can see, it's a little bit interactive here because it is using the Plotly package. And you can do stuff like panning and um, selecting and all that. Now I do believe this xplot package is an F-sharp package. So that, that's just another way to prove that you can use F-sharp with, within uh, F-sharp packages within C-sharp. All right, so another Thing we can look at is the marital status so do another group by marital and then uh, do account and I'll display that uh, let's see I always just I don't know why I always misspell this there we go so we have a lot of married people some single and some divorced and then we can do the same thing that we did above we can create a bar graph using the, the marital column and then use that age column as well. Um, once again, I must, of course, I'm going to spell it again. There we go. So we have a good representation number of married people, uh, some single people, and, and less divorced people. Then the next thing we can look at is the kind of the Um, the default label, uh, the column, because that's going to be our label that we're going to eventually uh, predict on. Let's get the value counts of those. And here we can see there's a lot more people who did not default on their loan than people who did, which kind of makes sense in the real world. Most people are going to pay their loans, right? Uh, but this does tell you that the data set is kind of skewed towards uh, people to did not default on their loan. And we can look it up again in a chart. We can use a histogram this time. So see how big the, the no chart is versus the yes. So that's one thing we have to look out for when we're doing predictions here is that our data is skewed towards this, the no label versus the yes. So now, if if you are a data science scientist or if you've done a lot with it, I'm sure there's a million other questions that you can ask with this. Uh, but I'm going to move on to uh, using Inmo.net to create a prediction on whether a person will default on a loan or not. So like always, the first thing you want to do is create your new Inmo context. And then I'm going to split my data using context dot data train test split pass in the data and I'll set a test fraction uh, 0 0.2 uh, I think it's actually not a string yep. and you might be wondering you probably already noticed here, but our data up here, this is actually a data frame object. It's not a add data view like you, you might have seen before. The reason for that is I can actually cast the data frame object into an add data view. So the data analysis team have already 
made sure that the data frame object is compatible with the add data view. So we can do stuff like this. We can use uh, the data frame object within mo.net. So we have the data view now, and I'm going to actually work on my features. And I'll just copy this. One thing I want to do is I want to look at my data view schema. And I'm going to select the column names. And then here, I want to make sure I don't want to get any of the, uh, the numerical values here. So I'm going to pick only the string columns, the categorical ones. And then next, I'm going to create a pipeline. Uh, so I'm going to create some text options because we're going to need that below here. Uh, the first thing in my pipeline is I want to convert the type. So the default column here, you can see here is a yes or no. So those are string values. But I need those into zero or ones, the numerical values. So I can just call the convert type, pass in the default column, tell it the output as uh, the label column and then tell what type that I want to convert to, and it's gonna do that conversion for me. And then next, I'm going to pass in those string columns that I did up above, and I'm gonna featureize those, so it's gonna do several items for me. It's gonna create a tokens, and get engrams, and do a bunch of other stuff for me, with just with this featureized text. And this text option is needed to pass in so I can pass in the array of string options. And then I'm just going to concatenate these two numerical values, the age and balance, into a column called features. Then I'm going to concatenate this features column into another features column, but I'm going to add in the text from this featureized text. The next I'm going to call a binary classification algorithm, the logistic regression. And then that's my pipeline. Next thing I want to do is let's do some cross validation here. And to do that, we do context dot binary classification. And we know it's binary classification because there's only two values that we're going to predict. And from there, we call cross validate. And then I'm going to pass in train the test set. And then pass in my pipeline. And with that, I would get a collection of uh, metric values. And then I would get the average of the area under the curve. And then I'll just write that out to the console here. Uh, let's see. And we see we get an area under the curve of about 90%, which isn't too bad, especially considering the, uh, the difference in uh, number of values here, how skewed this data is. So it's actually not too bad. And you can use AutoML here as well and that'll kind of go through a bunch of other different options for you a bunch of different algorithm options and it'll actually go through some hyperparameters within those as well so that might help you get uh, an AUC higher than this and now we can create our model by calling pipeline that fit train test split pass in a train set So now we have our model here. And now let's do some predictions. Now, before when we loaded in our data, we used the data frame package to do that for us. And it's all the way up here. Using the load CSV. And if you may if you've messed with ML.net before, you may have noticed you may have had to create a class that's kind of your input and output schema classes before you can load in your data. We didn't have to do that here, which is nice. It helps us get to our exploration a lot quicker than having to do that. But now that we've created our model and we want to do some predictions, we kind of have to create the, the classes here for us. And so I do a 
class bank data. And you, you may notice these are uh, lowercase. Uh, that is because they need to match the schema that we have in our in our data. And actually this default item, uh, because default is a keyword in C-sharp, we can prepend this add symbol on it so we can use that as a, uh, as a property name. And then for our output schema, we need print, uh, bank prediction and we need the predicted label, which is true or false. And we can also get the score, which is the probability and then we need to create a prediction a prediction function using context that model that prediction uh, create prediction engine now still i'm still used to it being a create prediction function that's why i keep calling this prediction func so i pass in the bank data input then the bank prediction output and uh, then just pass in the model. All right, so now that we have our prediction function, we can start making predictions. And so let's give it some sample data here. We notice the age 22 is entrepreneur, entrepreneur single, but he has a balance of negative 900. Uh, let's see what this prediction is. And we do prediction func that predict give the new data and then from the prediction we just call predicted label uh, helps if I spell correctly there we go so that is predicted that this person will they might default on his loan here uh, if we let's do another prediction here so this person here they're 44 they're in management they're married and they have 4200 uh, balance already and we'll do the same thing create a new prediction do prediction func dot predict pass in the item and then we can do new prediction predicted label and so if I spell correctly here oh I didn't run this that's why there we go and this guy they are predicted to not default on their loan here and so that's how we can use uh, the data frame uh, package in ml.net here in a Jupyter notebook. And this is kind of the same workflow that most data scientists and machine learning engineers will most likely be doing just to kind of help refine their, their models and get some information on their data. And so, and I know, I know <laughs> this is a, an Azure uh, event here and as soon as this talk got <laughs> accepted, I was like, wait a minute, I don't really do a lot of Azure here. And so, but what you can do now that we have this model and we've done some, uh, some pre preliminary predictions on it, um, you know, there's a lot of things we can do for Azure. For, mostly we can put that model or we can save it into a file and put that file into blob storage and then whatever application that we need uh, to use that in, whether it be web application, um, a, an event stream or a Xamarin application, we can we can use that. Uh, at the very least, we can create an API that uses that model. It gets it from Azure Blob Storage, and it it can uh, use that within our application, um, whether through the API or directly. And so that's probably the biggest ways you can use Azure within our models. But there, I mean, you can use it within a bot framework and with just a ton of other options there. And a lot of those examples, I do have videos on how you can do that. Uh, so feel free to look at those. 
So that's pretty much it for the coding part. I hope all that was interesting. All right. And before uh, before I leave, I do want to mention if you want to do if you can learn a lot more about um, mo.net, uh, me and Alexander Slot. Uh, I hope I pronounced his name right. Uh, we are co-organizing a virtual mo.net conference, and it's going to be May 29th and 30th. And to go to virtualml.net if you want to register. The 29th is going to be a workshop which is going to be from a couple of folks from Microsoft, giving just a ton of information on ML.net. So that's definitely going to be worthwhile. And then the 30th is going to be just a bunch of people giving presentations. So that's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting. I saw the presentations already uh, that people put in and they all look really good. And if you have a pre if you have one, there's a CFP at the virtual ML.net site. So feel free to sign up for that. And thanks for watching, and uh, I haven't seen any questions here, but if you have any, uh, definitely uh, send me a note on Twitter at jwood, or um, I'll do any, any of the comments on the videos, I'll definitely get to you as well. So thanks again for watching, and uh, I'll see y'all next time.